Welcome to the YouTube channel Bookworm. Today, we will listen to a brief retelling of the following book, Don Quixote by Miguel de Cervantes. In a certain village of La Mancha, there lived a Hidalgo, whose property consisted of a family spear, an ancient shield, a skinny nag, and a greyhound dog. His surname was either Quijana or Quisada, it is not known exactly, and it does not matter. He was about 50 years old, his body was lean, his face was thin, and he read chivalric novels for days on end, which made his mind completely upset, and he decided to become a knight errant. He polished the armor that belonged to his ancestors, attached a cardboard visor to the shishak, gave his old horse the sonorous name Rocinante, and renamed himself Don Quixote of La Mancha. Since a knight errant must be in love, the Hidalgo, on reflection, chose a lady of his heart, Aldonza Lorenzo, and named her Dulcinea of Toboso, because she was from Toboso. Dressed in his armor, Don Quixote set off, imagining himself the hero of a chivalric romance. After driving all day, he got tired and went to the inn, mistaking it for a castle. The unsightly appearance of the Hidalgo and his lofty speeches made everyone laugh, but the good-natured host fed and watered him, although it was not easy. Don Quixote would never take off his helmet, which prevented him from eating and drinking. Don Quixote asked the owner of the castle, E in, to knight him, and before that he decided to spend the night in vigil over the weapon, putting it on the watering trough. The owner asked if Don Quixote had money, but Don Quixote never read about money in any novel and took it with him. The owner explained to him that although such simple and necessary things as money or clean shirts are not mentioned in the novels, this does not mean at all that the knights did not have either. At night, one driver wanted to water the mules and removed Don Quixote's armor from the watering trough, for which he was hit with a spear, so the owner, who considered Don Quixote crazy, decided to knight him as soon as possible in order to get rid of such an uncomfortable guest. He assured him that the initiation rite consisted of a slap on the back of the head and a blow with a sword on the back, and after Don Quixote's departure, he joyfully delivered a speech no less grandiloquent, although not so lengthy than the newly made knight. Don Quixote turned back home to stock up on money and shirts. On the way, he saw a burly villager beating a shepherd boy. The knight stood up for the shepherd girl, and the villager promised him not to offend the boy and pay him everything he owes. Don Quixote, delighted with his beneficence, rode on and the villager, as soon as the defender of the offended disappeared from his eyes, beat the shepherd boy to a pulp. The oncoming merchants, whom Don Quixote forced to recognize Dulcinea of Toboso as the most beautiful lady in the world, began to mock him, and when he rushed at them with a spear, they bludgeoned him so that he arrived home beaten and exhausted. The priest and the barber, fellow villagers of Don Quixote, with whom he often argued about chivalric romances, decided to burn the pernicious books from which he was damaged in his mind. They looked through the library of Don Quixote and left almost nothing of it, except for a mattice of gall and a few other books. Don Quixote invited one farmer, Sancho Panza, to become his squire and told him so much and promised that he agreed. And then one night, Don Quixote mounted Rosinant, Sancho who dreamed of becoming the governor of the island, mounted a donkey, and they secretly left the village. On the way they saw windmills, which Don Quixote mistook for giants. When he rushed to the mill with a spear, its wing turned and smashed the spear to pieces, and Don Quixote was thrown to the ground. At the inn where they stopped to spend the night, the maid began to make her way in the dark to the driver, with whom she agreed to meet, but by mistake she stumbled upon Don Quixote, who decided that this was the daughter of the owner of the castle in love with him. A commotion arose, a fight ensued, and Don Quixote, and especially the innocent Sancho Panza, got it great. When Don Quixote, and after him Sancho, refused to pay for the lodging, several people who happened to be there pulled Sancho off the donkey and began to toss him on a blanket, like a dog during a carnival.
When Don Quixote and Santo rode on, the knight mistook a flock of sheep for an enemy army and began to crush the enemies to the right and left, and only a hail of stones that the shepherds brought down on him stopped him. Looking at the sad face of Don Quixote, Sancho came up with a nickname for him, the Knight of the Sorrowful Image. One night, Don Quixote and Sancho heard an ominous knock, but when dawn broke, it turned out that they were fooling hammers. The knight was embarrassed, and his thirst for exploits remained this time unsatisfied. Don Quixote mistook the barber, who put a copper basin on his head in the rain, for a knight in the helmet of Mambrina, and since Don Quixote took an oath to take possession of this helmet, he took away the basin from the barber and was very proud of his feet. Then he freed the convicts who were led to the galleys and demanded that they go to Dulcinea and give her greetings from her faithful knight. But the convicts did not want to, and when Don Quixote began to insist, they stoned him. In the Sierra Marina, one of the convicts, Gines de Passamont, stole a donkey from Sancho, and Don Quixote promised to give Sancho three of the five donkeys that he had on his estate. In the mountains, they found a suitcase containing some linen and a bunch of gold coins, as well as a book of poems. Don Quixote gave the money to Sancho and took the book for himself. The owner of the suitcase turned out to be Cardeno, a half-mad youth who began to tell Don Quixote the story of his unhappy love, but did not tell it because they quarreled because Cardano spoke ill of Queen Madasima in passing. Don Quixote wrote a love letter to Dulcinea and a note to his niece, where he asked her to give the bearer of the first donkey bill three donkeys, and, going mad for decency, that is, taking off his pants and turning somersaults several times, sent Sancho to take the letters. Left alone, Don Quixote surrendered to repentance, he began to think about what better to imitate, the violent insanity of Roland or the melancholy insanity of Amadis. Deciding that Amadis was closer to him, he began to compose poems dedicated to the beautiful Dulcinea. On the way home, Sancho Panza met a priest and a barber, his fellow villagers, and they asked him to show them Don Quixote's letter to Dulcinea. But it turned out that the knight forgot to give him the letters, and Sancho began to quote the letter by heart, twisting the text so that instead of impassionate Signora, he got a failsafe Signora, etc. The priest and the barber began to invent a means to lure Don Quixote out of Poor Rapids, where he indulged in repentance, and deliver him to his native village in order to cure him of insanity there. They asked Sancho to tell Don Quixote that Dulcinea had ordered him to come to her immediately. They assured Sancho that this whole undertaking would help Don Quixote become, if not emperor, then at least a king and Sancho, in anticipation of favors, willingly agreed to help them. Sancho went to Don Quixote, and the priest and the barber remained waiting for him in the forest, but suddenly they heard verses. It was Cardeno who told them his sad story from beginning to end. The treacherous friend Fernando kidnapped his beloved Lucinda and married her. When Cardino finished the story, a sad voice was heard and a beautiful girl appeared, dressed in a man's dress. It turned out to be Dorothea, seduced by Fernando, who promised to marry her, but left her for Lucinda. Dorothea said that Lucinda, after being engaged to Fernando, was going to commit suicide because she considered herself Cardino's wife and agreed to marry Fernando only at the insistence of her parents. Dorothea, learning that he did not marry Lucinda, had the hope of returning him, but she could not find him anywhere. Cardeno revealed to Dorothea that he was Lucinda's true husband, and they decided together to seek the return of what is rightfully theirs. Cardeno promised Dorothea that if Fernando did not return to her, he would challenge him to a duel. Sancho told Don Quixote, that Dulcinea was calling him to her, but he replied that he would not appear before her until he performed feats worthy of her mercy. Dorothea volunteered to help lure Don Quixote out of the forest and calling herself the princess of my Comic-Con, said that she had come from a distant country which had heard a rumor about the glorious knight Don Quixote 
in order to ask for his intercession. Don Quixote could not refuse the lady and went to my Comic Con. A traveler on a donkey came across them. It was Gaines de Passamont, a convict who was freed by Don Quixote and who stole Sancho's donkey. Santo took the donkey for himself, and everyone congratulated him on his good fortune. At the source they saw a boy, the very shepherd boy whom Don Quixote had recently stood up for. The shepherd boy said that the intercession of the Hidalgo had gone sideways for him, and cursed all the knights errant on what the world was worth, which made Don Quixote furious and embarrassed. Having reached the same inn where Sancho was tossed up on a blanket, the traveler stopped for the night. At night, a frightened Sancho Panza ran out of the closet where Don Quixote was resting. Don Quixote fought enemies in a dream and brandished his sword in all directions. Wine skins of wine hung over his head, and he, mistaking them for giants, flogged them and filled them all with wine, which Sancho, with fright, mistook for blood. Another company drove up to the inn a lady in a mask and several men. The curious priest tried to ask the servant about who these people were, but the servant himself did not know. He only said that the lady, judging by her clothes, was a nun or was going to a monastery, but apparently not of her own free will, and she sighed and cried all the way. It turned out that this was Lucinda, who decided to retire to the monastery, since she could not connect with her husband Cardino but Fernando kidnapped her from there. Seeing Don Fernando, Dorothea threw herself at his feet and begged him to return to her. He heeded her prayers, while Lucinda rejoiced at being reunited with Cardano, and only Sancho was upset, for he considered Dorothea the princess of my Comic-Con and hoped that she would shower his master with favors and also give him something. Don Quixote believed that everything was settled thanks to the fact that he defeated the giant, and when he was told about the perforated wineskin, he called it the spell of an evil wizard. The priest and the barber told everyone about Don Quixote's insanity, and Dorothea and Fernando decided not to leave him, but to take him to the village, which was no more than two days away. Dorothea told Don Quixote that she owed her happiness to him, and continued to play the part she had begun. A man and a Moorish woman drove up to the inn. The man turned out to be an infantry captain who had been taken prisoner during the Battle of Lepanto. A beautiful Moorish woman helped him escape and wanted to be baptized and become his wife. Following them, the judge appeared with his daughter, who turned out to be the captain's brother and was incredibly happy that the captain, from whom there had been no news for a long time was alive. The judge was not embarrassed by his deplorable appearance, for the captain was robbed on the way by the French. At night, Dorothea heard the mule driver's song and woke up the judge's daughter Clara so that the girl would also listen to her, but it turned out that the singer was not a mule driver at all, but a disguised son of noble and wealthy parents named Louise in love with Clara. She is not of very noble birth, so the lovers were afraid that his father would not give consent to their marriage. A new group of horsemen drove up to the inn. It was Louis's father who set out to chase his son. Louis, whom his father's servants wanted to escort home, refused to go with them and asked for Clara's hand in marriage. Another barber arrived at the inn, the same one from whom Don Quixote had taken the Mambrin's helmet and began to demand the return of his pelvis. A skirmish began, and the priest quietly gave him eight rees for the pelvis in order to stop it. Meanwhile, one of the guards who happened to be at the inn recognized Don Quixote by signs, for he was wanted as a criminal because he freed the convicts, and the priest had to work hard to convince the guards not to arrest Don Quixote, because he was out of his mind. The priest and the barber made something like a comfortable cage out of sticks, and agreed with a man who rode past on oxen that he would take Don Quixote to his native village. But then they released Don Quixote from the cage on parole, and he tried to take away the statue of the Immaculate Virgin from the worshippers, considering her a noble lady in need of protection. Finally, Don Quixote arrived home, where the housekeeper and niece put him to bed and began to look after him 
and Sancho went to his wife, who he promised that next time he would certainly return as a count or governor of the island, and not some seedy, but the best best wishes. After the housekeeper and niece nursed Don Quixote for a month, the priest and the barber decided to visit him. His speeches were reasonable, and they thought that his insanity had passed, but as soon as the conversation remotely touched on chivalry, it became clear that Don Quixote was terminally ill. Sanko also visited Don Quixote and told him that the son of their neighbor, bachelor Samson Carrasco, had returned from Salamanca, who said that the story of Don Quixote, written by Sid Ahmet Benenhali, was published, which describes all the adventures of him and Sancho Panza. Don Quixote invited Samson Carrasco to his place and asked him about the book. The bachelor listed all her advantages and disadvantages and said that everyone, young and old, is read by her, especially the servants love her. Don Quixote and Sancho Panza decided to set out on a new journey, and a few days later they secretly left the village. Samson saw them off and asked Don Quixote to report all his successes and failures. Don Quixote, on the advice of Samson, went to Zaragoza, where a jousting tournament was to take place, but first decided to call in Toboso to receive Dulcinea's blessing. Arriving in Toboso, Don Quixote asked Sancho where Dulcinea's palace was, but Sancho could not find it in the dark. He thought that Don Quixote knew this himself, but Don Quixote explained to him that he had never seen not only the palace of Dulcinea, but also her, for he had fallen in love with her according to rumors. Sanka replied that he had seen her and brought an answer to Don Quixote's letter, also according to rumors. So that the deceit would not surface, Sancho tried to take his master away from Toboso as soon as possible and persuaded him to wait in the forest while he, Sancho, went to the city to talk with Dulcinea. He realized that since Don Quixote had never seen Dulcinea, then any woman could be passed off as her, and seeing three peasant women on donkeys, he told Don Quixote that Dulcinea was coming to him with court ladies. Don Quixote and Sancho fell on their knees before one of the peasant women, while the peasant woman shouted rudely at them. Don Quixote saw in this whole story the witchcraft of an evil wizard, and was very saddened that instead of a beautiful senora, he saw an ugly peasant woman. In the forest, Don Quixote and Sancho met the Knight of Mirrors, who was in love with Castle Dia Vandal, who boasted that he had defeated Don Quixote himself. Don Quixote was indignant and challenged the Knight of Mirrors to a duel, according to which the defeated had to surrender to the mercy of the winner. Before the Knight of Mirrors had time to prepare for battle, Don Quixote had already attacked him and nearly killed him, but the Knight of Mirrors squire yelled that his master was none other than Samson Carrasco, who hoped in such a cunning way to bring Don Quixote home. But alas, Samson was defeated and Don Quixote, confident that the evil wizards had replaced the appearance of the Knight of Mirrors with the appearance of Samson Carrasco, again moved along the road to Zaragoza. On the way, Diego de Miranda overtook him, and the two Hidalgos rode together. A wagon carrying lions rode towards them. Don Quixote demanded that the cage with the huge lion be opened, and was about to chop him to pieces. The frightened watchman opened the cage, but the lion did not come out of it, but the fearless Don Quixote from now on began to call himself the Knight of Lions. After staying with Don Diego, Don Quixote continued on his way and arrived at the village where the wedding of Kateria the Beautiful and Camacho the Rich was being celebrated. Before the wedding, Basilo the Poor, Kateria's neighbor, who had been in love with her since childhood, approached Kateria and pierced his chest with a sword in front of everyone. He agreed to confess before his death only if the priest married him to Kateria and he died as her husband. Everyone persuaded Kateria to take pity on the sufferer. After all, he was about to give up his spirit and Kateria, having become a widow, would be able to marry Kamako. Kateria gave Basilo her hand, but as soon as they were married, Basilo jumped to his feet alive and well, 
He arranged all this to marry his beloved, and she seemed to be in cahoots with him. Kimako, on sound reflection, considered it best not to be offended. Why does he need a wife who loves another? After spending three days with the newlyweds, Don Quixote and Sancho moved on. Don Quixote decided to go down to the cave of Montesinos. Santo and the student guide tied him with a rope, and he began to descend. When all 100 braces of the rope were unwound, they waited for half an hour and began to pull the rope, which turned out to be so easy, as if there was no load on it, and only the last 20 braces were hard to pull. When they removed Devon Quixote, his eyes were closed, and they managed with difficulty to push him aside. Don Quixote said that he saw many miracles in the cave, saw the heroes of the old romances of Montesinos and Durandart, as well as the bewitched Dulcinea, who even asked him for a loan of six reels. This time his story seemed implausible even to Sancho, who knew well what kind of magician had bewitched Dulcinea, but Don Quixote stood his ground. When they reached the inn, which Don Quixote, as usual, did not consider a castle, Mays Pedro appeared there with a soothsayer monkey and a district. The monkey recognized Don Quixote and Sancho Panza and told everything about them. And when the performance began, Don Quixote, taking pity on the noble heroes, rushed with a sword at their pursuers and killed all the puppets. True, he then generously paid Pedro for the ruined rake so that he was not offended. In fact, it was Giants de Passamont, hiding from the authorities and taking up the craft of a rashnik. Therefore, he knew everything about Don Quixote and Sancho. Usually, before entering the village, he asked around about its inhabitants and for a small bribe, guest passed. One day, leaving at sunset on a green meadow, Don Quixote saw a crowd of people. It was the falconry of the Duke and Duchess. The Duchess had read a book about Don Quixote and was full of respect for him. She and the Duke invited him to their castle and received him as an honored guest. They and their servants played many jokes with Don Quixote and Sancho and did not cease to marvel at the prudence and madness of Don Quixote, as well as the ingenuity and innocence of Sancho, who in the end believed that Dulcinea was bewitched although he himself acted as a sorcerer and did all this himself. Rigged. The magician Merlin arrived in a chariot to Don Quixote and announced that in order to disenchant Dulcinea, Sancho must voluntarily whip himself on his bare buttocks 3,300 times. Sancho objected, but the Duke promised him an island and Sancho agreed especially since the period of scourging was not limited and it could be done gradually. Countess Trifaldi, also known as Gorvana, arrived at the castle, the duenna of Princess Metanemia. The sorcerer Evelstein turned the princess and her husband Trenbrino into statues, and the duenna Gorvana and twelve other duennas began to grow beards. Only the valiant knight Don Quixote could disenchant them all. Evelstein promised to send a horse for Don Quixote, who would quickly drive him and Sancho to the kingdom of Candaya, where the valiant knight would fight with Evelstein. Don Quixote, determined to rid the duennas of their beards, sat down with Sancho blindfolded on a wooden horse and thought that they were flying through the air, while the duke's servants blew air from furs on them. Flying back to the duke's garden, they found a message from evil flesh where he wrote that Don Quixote had disenchanted everyone by the mere fact that he had ventured into this adventure. Sancho was impatient to look at the faces of the beardless duennas, but the entire band of duennas had already disappeared. Sancho began to prepare to rule the promised island, and Don Quixote gave him so many reasonable instructions that he struck the duke and duchess. In everything that did not concern chivalry, he showed a clear and extensive mind. The Duke sent Sancho with a large retinue to a town that was supposed to pass for an island, for Sancho did not know that islands exist only in the sea and not on land. There he was solemnly handed the keys to the city and declared the life governor of the island of Barataria. To begin with, he had to resolve a lawsuit between a peasant and a tailor 
The peasant brought the cloth to the tailor and asked if a cap would come out of it. Hearing that it would come out, he asked if two caps would come out, and when he heard that two would come out, he wanted to get three, then four, and settled on five. When he came to receive caps, they were just on his finger. He became angry and refused to pay the tailor for the work, and in addition began to demand back the cloth or money for it. Sanko thought and pronounced a verdict. Do not pay the tailor for the work, do not return the cloth to the peasant, and donate the caps to the prisoners. Then two old men came to Sancho, one of whom had long ago borrowed ten pieces of gold from the other and claimed to have returned it while the lender said that he had not received the money. Sancho made the debtor swear that he had repaid the debt, and he gave the lender a moment to hold his staff and swore. Seeing this, Sancho guessed that the money was hidden in the staff and returned it to the lender. Following them, a woman appeared, dragging by the hand the man who allegedly raped her. Sancho told the man to give the woman his wallet and let the woman go home. When she left, Sanko ordered the man to catch up with her and take away the purse, but the woman resisted so much that he did not succeed. Sancho immediately realized that the woman had slandered the man. If she had shown at least half the fearlessness with which she defended her wallet when she defended her honor, the man would not have been able to defeat her. Therefore, Sanko returned the purse to the man and drove the woman off the island. Everyone marveled at the wisdom of Sancho and the justice of his sentences. When Sancho sat down at a table laden with food, he did not manage to eat anything. As soon as he stretched out his hand to any dish, Dr. Pedro Intolerable de Naca ordered it to be removed, saying that it was unhealthy. Sancho wrote a letter to his wife Teresa, to which the Duchess added a letter from herself and a string of coral and the duke's page delivered letters and gifts to Teresa, alarming the whole village. Teresa was delighted and wrote very sensible answers, and also sent half a measure of the best acorns and cheese to the duchess. The enemy attacked Barataria, and Sancho had to defend the island with weapons in his hands. They brought him two shields and tied one in front and the other behind so tightly that he could not move. As soon as he tried to move, he fell and remained lying, sandwiched between two shields. They ran around him, he heard screams, the sound of weapons, they were furiously hacked at his shield with a sword, and finally there were shouts, victory, the enemy has been defeated. Everyone began to congratulate Sancho on his victory, but as soon as he was raised, he saddled the donkey and went to Don Quixote saying that ten days of governorship was enough for him, that he was not born either for battles or for wealth, and did not want to obey anyone. Impudent doctor, no one else. Don Quixote began to be weary of the idle life he led with the duke, and left the castle with Sancho. At the inn where they stayed for the night, they met Don Juan and Don Geronimo, who were reading the anonymous second part of Don Quixote which Don Quixote and Sancho Panza considered a slander on themselves. It said that Don Quixote fell out of love with Dulcinea. While he loved her as before, the name of Sancho's wife was mixed up there, and it was full of other inconsistencies. Upon learning that this book describes a tournament in Zaragoza with the participation of Don Quixote, replete with all sorts of nonsense, Don Quixote decided not to go to Zaragoza, but to Barcelona, so that everyone could see that the Don Quixote depicted in the anonymous second part is not at all the one described by Sid Ahmed Benenhali. In Barcelona, Don Quixote fought the Knight of the White Moon and was defeated. The Knight of the White Moon, who was none other than Samson Carrasco, demanded that Don Quixote return to his village and not leave for a whole year hoping that during this time his mind would return to him. On the way home, Don Quixote and Sancho had to revisit the ducal castle, for its owners were as obsessed with jokes and practical jokes as Don Quixote was with chivalric romances. In the castle stood a hearse with the body of the maid Altisidora, who allegedly died of unrequited love for Don Quixote. To resurrect her, 
Sancho had to endure 24 taps on his nose, 12 pinches, and 6 pinpricks. Sancho was very displeased, for some reason, in order to disenchant Dulcinea. And in order to revive Altisidora, it was he who had to suffer, who had nothing to do with them. But everyone persuaded him so much that he finally agreed and endured the torture. Seeing how Altisidora came to life, Don Quixote began to hasten Sancho with self-flagellation in order to dispel Dulcinea. When he promised Sancho generously to pay for each blow, he willingly began to whip himself with a whip, but quickly realizing that it was night and they were in the forest, he began to whip the trees. At the same time, he moaned so plaintively that Don Quixote allowed him to stop and continue the scourging the next night. At the inn they met Alvaro Tarfi, bred in the second part of the fake Don Quixote. Alvaro Tarf admitted that he had never seen either Don Quixote or Sancho Panza who stood before him. But he had seen another Don Quixote and another Sancho Panza who were not at all like them. Returning to his native village, Don Quixote decided to become a shepherd for a year and invited the priest, the bachelor, and Sancho Panza to follow his example. They approved of his idea and agreed to join him. Don Quixote had already begun to remake their names in a pastoral way, but soon fell ill. Before his death, his mind cleared up and he no longer called himself Don Quixote, but Alonso Quijano. He cursed the romances of chivalry that clouded his mind, and died calmly and in a Christian way, as no knight errant died.